I'm glad you could join me today. I'm in the book of 1 Samuel. In chapter 5, there is a story about uh, the Ark of the Lord, the Ark of the Covenant that was captured during a, a raid that, uh, that the Philistine, the battle that the Philistines and the Israelites had. Now, first of all, I, I always struggle with the idea that uh, Israel took the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them as some sort of good luck charm for their victory. I know that that was something that ancient peoples did with pagan idols and all, but this is the God of Israel. This is the true and living God. He was not to be used as a, um, uh, just as a good luck charm, and yet they did. And he was captured then, or the the Ark of the, of the Covenant then was captured by, uh, by the people who, the, the Philistine people who were fighting them. And so in this particular passage, one of the things that I note here is that as it's captured, there is a common thing that happens in the um, in ancient pagan world where if you destroy or if you capture the, the God of your other, uh, uh, the God of your enemy, that you bring that into the temple of your God and you make sure that everybody sees that your God is greater than the God that you had captured. And so that's what the Philistines did. They brought the, the Ark of the Covenant into the uh, temple of Dagon, their, their God, their goddess of fertility, actually. And one of the things that happened when they did that, the next morning after they had put that God in there, the Ark of God, they brought it to Eb from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the, on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face downward on the ground before the Ark of the Lord and the head of Dagon, and both of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. And you see, that's what, that's because all creation is going to bow before the God of Israel. I, I titled this, Every Knee Will Bow, because we see that particular idea later on. Now, sometimes we think of that as just Christian people who have put their faith in Jesus, that they're going to bow the knee to him, and they have bowed the knee to him. That's true. They will be part of it. But every knee will bow. And when Paul tells us that, uh, uses that phrase, actually the first time that phrase is used is in Isaiah, but when Paul says of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and here we have the, uh, the, the gods of pagan uh, nations, excuse me, who are uh, going to be uh, worshiping the God of Israel, they will fall down on their faces before him. Their knees are going to bow, just as the knees of every infidel in our world is going to bow to Jesus one day. Now, we don't say that because we're mean. We don't say that because we are uh, somehow superior to people who have not put their faith in Christ. We say that because it's a reality, because it's true. And it's important that we communicate to everyone around us that the name of Jesus is the name before which every, every creation, every part of creation is going to worship. He's the one that we will bow before and we will worship. The gods of the ancient Philistines bowed before the God of Israel. In fact, the, this particular story uh, has a humorous note to it. I, I don't know if that's what the historian who wrote for Samuel uh, had in mind, but it certainly comes across as being uh, humorous in our day. That, uh, that those people who uh, tried to uh, hoist the God of Israel and, and suggest that he was subservient to their gods, they were afflicted with hemorrhoids, according to the New American Standard Translation. 
other translations say boils and tumors and that sort of thing. But, but the reality is that this was a very, very serious thing that they were trying to do to elevate their God above the God of Israel. Their knees were going to bow and the knees of their gods and their fetishes and their uh, idols were going to bow to the God of Israel. And we need to understand that in our day. So we have this particular example, and I, and I trust that your knee has bowed, and that of those near you, and, um, and those under your influence, that they will know that their knee will one day bow to Jesus. May it be. Father, we ask you to grant to us the grace that we need, first of all, to understand that we're going to bow our knees to you. And how much better it is if we do it while we can on this side of eternity, rather than being forced to do that by the sheer power of your presence. And so I ask, Father, that you would help us to be faithful to those in our circles, to communicate the truth that every knee will bow, including theirs and including ours. We're not better than people. We're not, we're not superior because we have been enlightened this way. Rather, we have just been one beggar who has found bread, and we want to share it with another. So help us to do just that in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I hope you have a great day.